best ever listeners. Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Ash Patel and I'm with my co-hosts, Slocum Reed and Travis Watts. And today we're doing another roundtable discussion. Today, we're going to deep dive into both being interviewed for a podcast and interviewing others for a podcast. And both of these gentlemen have been interviewed on other people's podcasts. So I'm going to start with a question. Slocum, do you remember your first podcast that you were interviewed on? I do. Hey, best of listeners, Slocum Reed, apartment owner operator and the newest of the best ever podcast hosts. I believe I've been on the fewest podcasts as well. I do remember it was just last year. And how did that experience go? You were nervous leading up to it, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah. Showed up way early. And how was the performance? On a Red Bull. Um, I, I think it went well, all things considered. I think it was well received. I, um, based on advice that I had gotten, uh, I focused on adding value where possible. What is it that I know that, that, that needs to be shared? And I think it was well received. Awesome. Travis, your first podcast, and you've done a ton of them. How well prepared were you? How did it go? And how nervous were you? Yeah, funny story. So I, I did a one-off podcast way, way, way back when, back when I was investing in single family homes and before the affiliation with Joe Fairless, well before these syndications that I do today and being a full-time passive investor. And I, I was super unprepared. I couldn't believe that I was asked to, to be <laughs> interviewed. And so everything about that episode was pretty much terrible. My microphone was terrible. The lighting was terrible. Everything I said was terrible. <laughs> so uh, it, it was, uh, I kind of got a curveball, so to speak. But, you know, it's been a, a learning progress uh, over the years. And um, we were just talking before this, done over 100 at this point. And I think, like anything, you get better, you improve, you, you take notes. How did that go? Terrible. <laughs> what can I change and do better next time? And, you know, I think most of us can, can improve over time. Well, you sound like an absolute pro right now. So that's what it takes. Just a lot of practice. I'll share my story. Joe Fairless interviewed me back in 2015 and <clears throat> I was excited about the interview and leading up to it, I was quite nervous. So I tried to prepare as much as I could. I had numbers and narratives on all the deals that I had done prepared to talk about all of the deals that I've done, my history, everything. Um, all of that went out the window because the night before my wife had some, her colleagues over for dinner and that ended up being like a three in the morning night. And Joe's interview was like as, as early as we can make it the next day. So I'm running on fumes. Um, and I was super nervous. I remember, uh, in, you know, it was very painful to listen to that interview afterwards. Uh, after the interview, I almost called him and asked if we can redo it. It was that bad. So um, I remember I was very nervous. So I would talk fast and then I would answer his questions before he even finished them. I was afraid of the pauses, uh, man. It was horrible. Um, they must've done some crazy editing because it sounded a little better when I heard it, but it was still, it was not good. And if we can reference that interview in the show notes, that'd be good. I'm not going <laughs> to listen to it again, but um, yeah, it was not good. Uh, by anybody's account. So my next question is, you're all hosts of podcasts of this podcast. Do you remember your first interview and how did it go? And what was the big lesson learned from the first one? My Sorry. first episode was probably the most recent. So I'll go first. Uh, my first episode was definitely the most recent. I, um, the biggest mistake I made was letting the guest lead the conversation. And so uh, I, I, I let them ramble on in stories too long uh, after, to use, I mean, too surgical of terms, but after the value had been extracted from the story and it was time to move on, I just let them kept, keep going because I thought it was a fun story. That was the biggest thing, especially with a, a podcast our style that's a shorter form more commuter podcast we we need to be um we need to be getting value from every minute in these interviews so the biggest thing for me was making sure 
I'm running the show, running the conversation and making sure that we're adding value. Travis, about your first interview. Yeah, the first time I interviewed someone, I was probably equally as nervous. And it's because of the unknowns, right? You don't know what the responses are going to be. You don't know when someone goes in a, a five minute story or if it drops off in 20 seconds and then you're <laughs> you're trying to fill some blank space and things like that. I feel way more in control when I'm being interviewed because I can just tell my story like it is and take the time I need and stay on track. I think the biggest takeaway for anyone who's going to be interviewing other people to Slocum's point Go into it with as much organization as you can. Have a template, have a defined, know your time frame, stay on track, lead the conversation, have questions, you know, proactively written or prepared uh, so that you're not, you know, going into it blind and, and caught with some awkward silences or going over 40 minutes, you know, when it's a 20 minute podcast or something like that. Man, you guys are pros because my first week of interviews was just disastrous. So bad. I got an email from Joe Fairless and um, it was a nice long email where he critiqued a lot of things. But one of the biggest things he critiqued is my energy. And, you know, I got to tell you, it, it, you guys as podcast hosts and seeing, listening to other people's podcasts, it doesn't look that hard. It doesn't seem that hard. It just seems like a natural conversation but it's a lot harder than at least I thought. And Joe's specific comment on energy, he said, I've seen how you welcome people that come to your house. Why can't you have that same energy for our guests on the podcast? And when I heard my own interview, uh, again, it just, your energy, even if you have a decent amount of energy, for whatever reason in the podcast, it comes across as muted. So you really got to overdo it to make it sound somewhat appealing, right? So, yeah, I mean, again, you guys have a much shorter learning curve than I did. I was just a train wreck on both sides of the microphone. Um, Gosh, I got, you know, I got that same feedback. And I'll tell you, I usually listen to podcasts at about one and a half times speed so that I can just pick up everything quickly. And when my episodes of the Best Ever Podcast first aired, I, I was listening at one and a half speed because that was my habit. But I put it down to normal speed and I was like, oh man, I sound lethargic. I sound, I sound like I either just woke up or I'm headed to bed. Uh, and so that was, that was feedback that I definitely needed to hear as well. I make sure I have a good stock of caffeine on hand uh, on, on recording days just to make sure. And then I do all of, for a very similar reason, I do all of my interviewing standing up. I'm, I'm at a standing desk right now just to make sure I'm, I'm physically able to lean in. And I feel like you can hear that now that I'm listening through some of my more recent episodes. I think you can, you can, you can hear when I physically lean in, the energy level rises. Yeah, that's a really great point, Slocum, because I was looking back at some of the video interviews where I was being interviewed before, and I'm slouched back in a chair or on a couch. And it really didn't come out great on the audio, you know, and so I've experimented with standing desks uh, for many years. I did it that way, um, you know, exercising right before an interview. I've definitely done the, the caffeine thing you talk about. <laughs> I mean, you got to do something, um, listen to your favorite song and get pumped up and then go right into the interview, stuff like that. I've done a lot of different things to experiment. I think at the end of the day, you got to do what's right for you, what makes sense. But yeah, I mean, the medium is audio, right? A lot of folks aren't watching visually. And so that's all you got is your voice inflection. And so you just got to give it your best. Because if you're boring, like a Ben Stein interview, <laughs> people are going to tune yeah. out. <laughs> Travis, do you stand up now? I, I, I hybrid mix it. So right now I'm actually sitting because of where my I have a little mobile office. And sometimes I'm standing. So it depends. Yeah, I do the same thing, Slocum. I stand up as well big difference. Both of you mentioned leading the conversation when you're interviewing somebody. Give me a little bit more insight on that. And I want to ask, how do you address when somebody just kind of has a pre-planned five minute long dissertation? How do you interject? Slocum, I'll let you start. Absolutely. So the analogy that I think of, and I think this is also the reason why Travis said he feels like he's in more control when he is the interviewee. I, I treat it like it's my job to open the right doors and then let the 
uh, the person I'm interviewing walk through them. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what their answers to the questions are, but get a feel for where this person's expertise is, where their experience is, and then uh, open the doors that allow them to walk through and add that value. What was, what was the original how, question? How do you address that individual yes. that just wants to dominate and just not even breathe between sentences and just talk, talk, talk? Yeah. So I would say first, it's not just, it's not just the, the three of us. It's not just the interviewer. It's also the producer. Uh, that has happened in a lot of the conversations that I've had on this podcast and you don't catch nearly as much of it because Kevin catches it. And there are times when uh, outside of what gets, what airs, I tell someone, Hey, look, this is a short form podcast. I, you, you've got great stories, but we've only got 15 more minutes and we've got, some, we've got places to go. That's, that's generally, and that's a little bit more gracious than saying something like stop talking about yourself that way. Um, like, Hey, we've got, look, man, my, we, it's a daily, it's a daily podcast. We do a lot of interviews. I have a, I have, I have another interview coming up. I really want to make sure we add value and I, and, and that you, you have a, you have a good opportunity uh, to express yourself here. So let's answer this question and then I'll, I'll, I'll go into a question and that's what you actually hear on the recording. Well, a couple answers from my perspective. One, it's a very difficult situation, all right, to handle. And so on the actively passive show that I do, it's usually just myself. It used to be Theo Hicks and I. I've had, I think, one guest in almost 100 episodes on that show. So that's the short answer, right? Don't have a guest. Um, <laughs> but the larger thing is, to Slocum's point, set the expectation up front. Um, it, it starts with the initial email, in my opinion, saying, this is a short form podcast. It's about 20 minutes long. Please bring your best value. Here's some potential questions we might ask during the thing. If, if somebody comes on board, and, and, and I, I verbalize that before we hit the record button too, right? To make sure that we're in alignment. If somebody's gonna blow through that with a 30 minute long story, it's gonna be done in editing. I mean, pretty much long, long story short, you know, we're gonna chop that down to what it needs to be, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, cause it's kind of not really respecting that person's time. You know, it's the same thing as when I'm being interviewed. Uh, someone tells me 20 minutes, I'm not gonna go into my 30 minute story. Yeah, Travis, uh, Slocum mentioned Kevin. Kevin is our podcast audio yes. editor, the best in the business, but not everybody has somebody to that caliber editing audio. I'll tell you what I do is, um, you know, I'm from Jersey in normal everyday life. I have no problem talking over people, cutting people off as they're talking. But for whatever reason on podcasts, I was very respectful. I did not interrupt people or I tried not to. But when you have somebody that, you know, it might just be their personality. When they start talking, they don't stop. I found what works best for me is kind of agree on one of their positions and take over the, the conversation. So if they say, you know, so in my opinion, the economy is going to change. Well, you know what? I agree with you. Yeah, the economy is going to change. But what was your first deal like? <laughs> yeah. Right? So yeah. Um, totally. Totally. you go along with them. And uh, then you take back the reins of the conversation. It's a great point. I was watching one the other day with, uh, <laughs> with Robert Kiyosaki interviewing somebody. And I would say that's that may be one example of what not to do. <laughs> it was a lot of very abrupt, rude interruptions and cutting things short or just going to an advertisement or something. But yeah, there's more graceful ways to do it. I think that's an excellent point, Ash. Yeah. Uh, so another thing that uh, I caught myself doing a lot is starting sentences with so. And I've, I've, I've seen that a lot of the interviewees, people that I interview do the same thing. And I wonder if it's just a nervous thing, a normal habit that comes out more when you're nervous, but um, I replaced so with the person's name. So instead of starting a sentence with so, I would say, Travis, tell me about so-and-so, right? Like um, what kind of big life-changing tics or nuances did you notice about your interview style that you fixed? Who do you want to start with? <laughs> uh, we're going to start with Travis this time. Give Slocum a break. 
Yeah, well, that's an excellent point because everybody loves to hear their own name. You know, it's kind of a rapport builder too. It's also a sign of respect uh, in, in some regard, right? To use people's names, not just like, hey man, <laughs> why don't you tell me how you got started, right? It's just remembering the, their name in the first place. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the thing that's helped the most is, is what I was kind of referring to earlier, which is um, being as proactive as possible, starting with emailing them the expectations and make sure your microphone set up properly, make sure you have good lighting. It's going to be 20 minutes long. This is what I intend to ask you. Here's some questions I put together. And by the way, I always try to customize. I mean, your guys' role may be a little bit different in the interviews that I've done where I have brought guests on. I always look at that actual person, what they actually do. And I try to find creative questions to ask them that haven't been asked in every episode leading up to this so that we have something unique of value to share. And then as I get them kind of in the in the green room, so to speak, before we go live with it, I always reiterate uh, my points. I, I intend to ask you this. Is there anything else you wanted to address? Is there anything you wanted me to avoid or not talk about? And then we just go in with as much rapport as possible. I usually try to throw a compliment in there as I can. Hey, I watched this video with you or this other interview. And I love what you said about blah, blah, blah. I'd like to elaborate on that and take it in this direction. Would that be okay? I it's I know that's extreme. I know that for some folks it sounds like maybe too much work or something, but you got to remember, I haven't put too many uh, guests on my show in the first place. So I've, I've had the luxury of being able to do that kind of research. And I recognize not everybody has, but that's really made a big impact. Awesome. Slocum. A few years ago, I joined a Toastmasters group, uh, which, which leads to, you know, listening to a lot of people give speeches and receive uh, constructive criticism from other people who give speeches and have uh, more experience than they or I did. One of the things that was really helpful learning from Toastmasters is that those, those verbal tics are subconscious but serve a purpose they they fill or take over the soundscape uh, to do one of two things typically one of them is to either maintain control of the soundscape uh so that you know that i'll be saying something in a moment and you know that you should be listening they also it, they also take over the soundscape to give you um to give the person with the verbal tick the, to give everyone else the opportunity to know that they need to be listened to. That's where the so comes in. I love, I, I love what you said, Ash, about replacing that tick with the person you're interviewing, their name. Another thing that, another piece of feedback that I got really early on with this podcast was that I said awesome too much because I was looking for one of those cues to, uh, to go to after someone gave an answer. And very often their answers were awesome, but I was saying the same thing over and over again, and it was getting too repetitive. And so I'm a little more aware now of what those, those cues are. They are helpful though, especially when you need your interviewee to redirect their attention to your next question. So therefore, using a couple of ticks now, be sure that you change it up and you use them to catch the attention of the person that you're talking to while also staying respectful to Travis's point and not getting too repetitive. So that one was awesome. To, what, sorry, one thing to add to that, I love that. Absolutely, I just remembered you're talking about the most impactful thing or some of those, those uh, tips and tricks. Editing out in the beginning some of what you're talking about. I used to be terrible at dragging the word um. It was horrible. So if you record yourself for 10 minutes straight, don't give yourself any breaks or whatever, and then go back and listen to it, I would say something and go, um, you know, like blah, 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 uh, blah, 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 blah. And so I had to edit in the beginning a lot of that stuff out. I was self-editing until I could pick up the pattern of, of not doing it, you know, fixing that. Yeah, I think it also helps to practice uh, just when I talk to my kids, if I remember to do this, I will speak with them as if I am in a podcast, right? Every so often uh, and not talk like I normally do a guy from Jersey. Uh, but, you know, Toastmasters, uh, there's a guy named Nate Barger, who is just a legend yes. in real estate. 
And yes. Nate and I talked about going to Toastmasters and he's like, no, they're going to take your personality away. The, like they're going to teach you how to speak in a corporate boardroom, but that's not, that's, it doesn't do wonders for your personality, right? It doesn't connect y- the real you with the audience. So I decided probably out of laziness and what Nate said that I'm not doing Toastmasters. I'm going to keep my, you know, nuances and, and, you know, all my little ticks and to some extent, uh, but moving on. So uh, another question. So I just started a sentence with, so Travis and Slocum, another topic I want to touch on is uh, talking about humility, talking about failure and using that to add value in connecting with the audience. I got to tell you some of my best interviews were from a guy who was a B-1 Air Force pilot, very rigid, very strict, uh, you know, just spoke as if he was still in the military. But then towards the end of the interview, we talked about where he had just a financial disaster and had to reset. And it was very humbling. He was very vulnerable at the moment. And that built an incredible connection with myself and the audience. And to this day, one of my favorite interviews. What's your guys' opinion and how do you either share that vulnerability or try to extract it from the person you're interviewing? Yeah, hundred percent. I think it makes you real. And I think it's very relatable to people. It, it plays a lot into the psychology of earning trust with someone. If you get on a show and I've made this mistake before, right? Cause you want to say the right things and you want to whatever, you know, show people the way, so to speak, and you want to leave out kind of the, the bad stuff and you just want to showcase the good. You lose rapport, number one, you sound fake and a lot of people don't trust it, right? Because you get up there, real estate's awesome. I've always had great success. You know, I got from zero to a hundred doing it and, you know, you ought to do it too. It's just cheesy, you know, it's not real. You've got to have, if you watch any movie, right? There's always like the progress and then the setback, right? And then the recovery and rebuild and then the final outcome. I mean, you've got it. You can't miss that, that setback. I think that's an important piece to telling your story and uh, building a story brand, I think is the name of the book, Donald Miller's book, but I'm sure there's a lot of other resources out there, but you got to tell your story, you know, and I think that's a a critical key that cannot be missed. Travis, how do you extract that from the person you're interviewing? Again, for me personally, it's always a proactive approach. It's, I would like to ask you not just about your successes, but any failures you had and what you learned from those lessons along the way. I, I always want to do that up front and not put them in an uncomfortable state by spontaneously bringing it out. You know, it's like, great for you, but, but tell me where you failed. You know, some, that can be uncomfortable if you're not prepared to talk about it. I love that. And I'm going to start using that in the beginning. Let them know. Yeah. Thank you for that. Slocum. I need to start doing that as well, Travis. I actually wrote for myself in my own pre-recording, pre-interview notes that, and, and this is to expound on what you guys both said. For everyone who's listening to this, who wants uh, to be a good interviewee and have a big impact, speaking selfishly on behalf of interviewees and on behalf of myself when I'm being interviewed, the most impactful thing that I can do is teach, add value to the people who are listening somehow. People don't tune into a podcast to hear about someone because they're successful. They, they tune in to learn something and, and in some cases to connect. So it's very valuable, of course, to, to build that human connection, talk, being willing to talk about your failures, the struggles that you've had, also, it's if selfishly speaking, as an interviewee, if your goal is self-promotion, the best, the best way to attract the most listenership to yourself and get people to connect with you is to tell them something that you had to struggle through and how you've learned from it and connect with that type of struggle victory story. That's what that's what people are really listening into. What did you, Mm -hmm. to, to be blunt, lack of a better term, what did you suck at that you needed to not suck at? And so you improved because those, those are the things. And those are the stories, the stories that come from hardship 
where, where you had to learn and grow and are therefore sharing something that someone else can learn and grow from, that's what comes off the best in an interview in one of these podcasts for sure. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. I just want to add one quick thing on that. And it's that I made one critical mistake early on when I was sharing my story. And what it was is I was sharing the vulnerabilities. I was sharing the struggle. I was being too specific where people could not relate to it. Right. I was using too yeah. many details in my story. I was saying, you know, my boss's name was Bob and I was in Saudi Arabia working for an oil company. Well, how many people have, you know, a manager, Bob, that work in Saudi Arabia in the oil company? So instead, I would rework that into, you know, I worked 100 hours a week. I was away from home a lot. And, you know, the struggle was real, you know, and so a lot more people can relate to that. So many good points, uh, Travis. So giving people your mindset at the time, in addition to the details, you know, here's what I thought when I was working 80, 100 hour weeks and that people can relate with. So important. Slocum, to your points, talking about self-promoting in contrast with offering that humility. I think you're allowed to self-promote once you share your vulnerabilities and your failures, right? If you just go through the entire interview, self-promoting, you never build a connection with the audience or the person interviewing you. So if you want to self-promote, share your story, share your failures, right? Share your mindset. You can, you can share a story that was a huge win, but temper that with saying, I was so nervous. I almost didn't do this deal. I was so scared to ask these investors for money, whatever it may be. So bring people into your world. Yeah. Two gentlemen. things. Yeah. Go. If, if I can interject real quick, the Please. first, uh, frankly, I think the best self promotion is when you have shared your vulnerability, your struggle and your loss and how you overcame them. That's, that's, uh, that is what leads to the best results for someone who is, who is looking to self promote is, is to, is to demonstrate or explain where they have struggled. Uh, and, and what it is that they had to learn, what was hard for them that they had to overcome and how they overcame it. That's the best self-promotion. Second thing, Ash, one thing I'm learning from you is how to give a solid, succinct summary of a conversation or an interview at the end uh, to, to bring the listeners back into what was just said and put a good bow on the end of a conversation. You, you are so good at that. Thank you. I learned that from listening to Joe all those years. He, he does nice. a masterful job at doing that. Awesome. Gentlemen. Awesome. So awesome. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today on behalf of my co-hosts, Slocum Reed and Travis Watts, best ever listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review, share this podcast with someone you think can benefit from it. Also follow subscribe and have a best ever day.